Good morning. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind standing, we're in John chapter 21, verse 15, as we come actually to the closing verses of the Gospel of John. Jesus is with his disciples. They're on a beach on the Sea of Galilee. And when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to Peter, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said it to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Thus he spoke, signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the Last Supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Let's stop there and pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this is an eyewitness account of that day. So help us to put ourselves in the story and grow in you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us now so that we might be different when we leave this place. We ask that in Jesus' name and all of God's people agreed by saying, amen. amen. You may be seated, please. Need another chance? Who doesn't? <laughs> by hook and by crook is uh, this whole chapter. We uh, talked about that a little bit last week. If you missed that, it, it's a saying in English that started in the 14th century in 1380. Uh, the guy that translated the Bible into English, William Tyndall, uh, wrote a little pamphlet, like a gospel track, and that was the title of it, by hook and by crook. And it's really a definition of what you and I are supposed to do with our lives. Hook being fishing, you and I are supposed to fish for men for the kingdom of God. And then the crook is the shepherd's crook for tending sheep. And so we're to be helpful to young sheep, to new believers, and, uh, and help them along the road of life, and older believers for that matter. So there's a quick summary of God's call on your life to fish and to shepherd. And uh, this section is the last part of that idea. And uh, it is a, a picture of uh, the disciples in their most vulnerable moments, I guess you could say. Uh, if you're just joining us, um, here's where we are in John's gospel. Jesus has, of course, been, died, been crucified, buried, rose on the third day, appeared to uh, some women and then the apostles, and then appeared to 11 of them in a hidden room. 
Uh, and he said there in Matthew 28, 16, uh, go to Galilee and meet me on a mountain. So he gave them a command in that room. Uh, you're supposed to go north. It's about 70 miles up to the lake and go up on a mountain. They evidently knew which mountain he was talking about. We don't know exactly what it was. He had already told them to be fishers of men. But instead of waiting on the mountain, Peter, who's probably a little frustrated by this time, things weren't going well, decided to go back to his old profession of fishing and drags the others with him. Um, They fished all night, as is still normal on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, They would fish in those days with a torch on the front of the boat, and they'd throw round, about 12-foot round nets out, and the lights would attract the fish normally. This night, mm, it was like nothing. They didn't catch anything, not a minnow, nothing. And all night long. So Peter probably wasn't feeling much like a disciple at this time. You remember that Peter had made some pretty strong statements about how he was going to be faithful to the Lord. Matthew 26, 30, 30, Peter Peter answered and said to Jesus, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter decides he hasn't buried himself quite deep enough, so he adds, Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so the rest of the disciples joined in. We saw in chapter 18, uh, it's related to this story, this event that happened, because there Peter is in the courtroom, or it's actually outdoors, a patio, and a courtyard, and he's talking to the, Jesus being interrogated by the high priest. And you'll remember that Peter is back in the corner by a fire, a charcoal fire, and uh, he's watching. And that made him a target. Three different people came up to him and asked him if he was part of the disciples. And three times he said no. When he said it the third time, a rooster crowed. And then he looked and Jesus turned and looked at him. And Peter was so embarrassed that he ran out the gate. And he's struggling. Uh, Peter felt like a total, absolute, complete utter failure. So the disciples have gone fishing. Peter is mentally in that condition, depressed, frustrated. So he leads a men's ministry, fishing. And after a very long night of emptiness, trying to do it without Jesus, there's a lesson here, the morning breaks and Jesus is on the shore, but they don't know it's him. And so Jesus asked them how they were doing fishing, and Peter said, we didn't catch a thing, which was the biggest miracle in the New Testament. A fisherman told the truth. (laughs) Why is it only the wives are laughing? What? What? (laughs) And so Jesus tells them to throw the net on the other side of the boat, which is kind of ridiculous if you've done any fishing. The, the boat is four foot wide and there's fish all around. But Jesus said, you throw it over on the right side and you'll catch them. And of course, a huge catch of fish fills the net. And then they realize that it's Jesus on the shore. And John says, it's the Lord. Peter's so excited, he jumps in and swims the shore even though it's about 100 yards. So John is putting the Gospel of John, the author is putting together chapter 18 where Peter has denied Jesus three times. And here in chapter 21, we can easily see that Jesus is making him confess three times to his failure, to his mistakes. But it's a beautiful picture of grace. God's unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. And Jesus sets it up. This is a God incident. 
He sets it up just like he does in your life and in mine to make it easy for Peter to come back. This is grace in action. Peter is in bad shape, but, but both events are set up in such a way he had to have seen it. Both events happen around a charcoal fire. Both events, um, the big fisherman is called Simon, which is a demotion, if you'll remember, because he had been called uh, Petros, which is the rock. And he's going backwards. And both events, Peter is questioned three times. So you can see that the tie is really obvious. And, uh, but it's meant to encourage you and I that when we blow it, of course, some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are going, me? Me? Sin? Never happened. That's what Peter said. It'll never happen. But it's to make us see the parallels and to realize that this God that we're serving is the God of the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance and the fifth chance and on and on it goes. So three parts of this section, 15 through 19, three questions and a commission of Jesus. He's recommissioning Peter. Then the comparisons, 20 through 23, and then the truth, John swears to it in a very legal form in the last couple of verses. That's where we're going. First question, corresponding to the first question when Jesus was arrested, aren't you one of his disciples? Peter said, no, not me. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now, we can't be certain that he's talking about the disciples, some have suggested he's talking about fishing. Do you love fishing more than me? I don't think that's what it is. I think it's because Peter had already bragged that he loved Jesus more than the rest of the disciples. So I think he's saying, do you love them? Do you love th these men? Or do they love me more than you do? Now, a whole bunch of things going on here. First of all, Jesus calls him Simon. Now, Simon, um, Simone in the Greek language in Hebrew is, um, means gravel or sand, little tiny stones. And Jesus said, from now on, you're going to be known as Petros, Peter, which means a rock, a solid rock, one that doesn't move. And so you might say that Peter's been, do, been demoted and his name has been changed from Rocky to Pebbles. Okay. So Jesus asked him, do you love me? Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that the Greeks are um, much more verbose than the English language. Uh, I could say, well, I, I love the Lord, I love my wife, uh, I love old Martin guitars. And then you might say, well, well, those are obviously different things. You love your wife differently than you love an old Martin guitar. And I said, well, of course I do. How old is the Martin guitar? No, it was just, <laughs> <laughs> she's here, I'm in trouble. Um, but in the Greek language, the highest form of love is agape. You've probably heard this. There's actually three others, but agape is the one that is selfless. When John would write in his letter, God is love, he uses that word, agape. When Jesus asks Peter the first two times, he uses that word. So Peter said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me more than these? Are you selflessly enjoying a re personal relationship with me that you give and you don't expect anything in return? So this, how much does God love me? A guy came up after the service last night and he said, I, I'm really wondering how much it is. And so Eric Nassen was a Norwegian scientist. He won the Nobel Prize in the late 1800s. 
Uh, he was an explorer. He was a polymath, they call him. He was an expert in, in 20 different subjects. And he explored the, the route from Norway up to the North Pole. And he wanted to discover how, how deep the ocean was. Now, this is the 1870s, and so there's no electronic gear around. So how do you measure the depth? You get a long cord, a long <laughs> rope. And he got one that was a mile and a half long. He had it specially made with a, a lead weight on the bottom. And as they're going north, he's taking soundies. He's checking the depth. And, uh, and finally, they got far enough up, it, it goes deeper and deeper underneath the North Pole, uh, the string didn't hit the bottom. And he wrote in his diary that day, the ocean is deeper than that. They looked around, they found some, the ship had some, some, a line in it, and so they tied that to the, the mile and a half long line that he brought with him, and they got it to almost two miles. And so they're going along, and for several days, uh, they had, took the sound as he'd write it down. And then finally, after the fifth day, he dropped it down and went all the way down, and it didn't touch the bottom. And he wrote again, deeper than that. So they went through everything they could find. They saw another boat. They asked them for line. They got it. They went down more than two and a quarter miles. And so same thing happened. They're heading north. And finally, that line couldn't touch the bottom. And he wrote, deeper than that. All he knew that he, all, all he knew that was going on was that it was beyond his ability to measure. Now, I told you that story because we can't plumb the depths of God's love either. There's no way you can reach the end of it. That's what these verses are saying. The measuring line, our life, is too short. Matthew 22:37. Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? You'll remember he quotes two, Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. You should love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And he uses the word agape. You shall agape the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and love your neighbor, same problem, agape, as yourself. Whew. So Jesus is using a word that is the most dedicated term of love. Other ones, storge, affection, like you would for a puppy, or, uh, eros, romantic love, phileo. Um, the city of Philadelphia is called Philadelphia, phileo, um, because brotherly love. It's supposed to be the city of brotherly love. If you're from Philly, you know it's a good place to get mugged and have your car stolen, but uh, no worse than L.A., don't misunderstand, don't mean to offend you. So this uh, reciprocating love, that's what phileo is, well, comes into this. So do you love me more than this? And we, t we don't know whether it's the men or whether it's fishing, but I think it, it is the men. Lord, you know that I... Catch this, Peter says, phileo you. Jesus said, do you agape me? And Peter says, well, um, he's trapped like a rat. And he says, you know that I've, I'm fond of you, Lord. Now, Peter isn't quite so self-assured anymore. He's kind of beat up. He knows he's failed. He remembers the boastful promise, I'll never. So Peter answers, I'm fond of you, Lord. Peter uses the weaker Greek word because he's feeling pretty Greek and pretty weak at the time. Excuse me. Jesus said, are you willing to sign yourself over, abandon yourself to me, agape, never looking back? That's the real question here. Discipleship, surrendering your life. Peter's a little nervous about that. Well, you know that I'm fond of you, Lord. You know that I care for you a lot, really. He wimped out. So Jesus is asked about agape love, all giving, uncaused, unselfish love, and Peter answers with phileo love, friendly affection. Feed my lambs, Jesus said. 
So now this idea of shepherding comes up. He already knew he was a fisher of men. Now Jesus is saying, feed, tend, take care of lambs or sheep. It's a commission. It's an invitation with a promise. The, the Greek word bosko, B-O-S-K-O, um, means to feed little uh, from the youngest lambs all the way up. So take care of all of them. Yes, Lord, I know. You know that I love you. Feed. So, ten, watch over. Potomeo, the Greek word means to care for the whole flock. That's the second question. Sixteen. He said to him a second time, Simon Peter, do you agape me? He said, well, well yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said, ten, my sheep. Take care of them all. He keeps bringing up sheep. Fish. He's already spoken about it. Now he's talking about shepherding. He's talking about it for Peter, but he's also talking about it for you and for me. Third question, verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jono, listen, do you phileo me? <laughs> Jesus brings the standard down because that's what Peter kept answering. But now Peter, it says, is grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love him? But he's particularly grieved because he speaks Greek real good and Jesus just lowered the bar. And he said to him, Lord, good answer, you know all things. You know it all. You read my mind, you read my heart, you know exactly what I was doing yesterday, you know what I'll be doing a year from now. You know that I phileo you. And he doesn't try and up the ante, he just says, I am fond of you, Lord. He's being truthful. That's where he really is. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, Lord, you know all things. Obviously, Peter understood who he was with, creator of the universe. And uh, it is uh, the grace of God that holds him there again. Peter is this struggling with this threefold question. It sounds like God is criticizing him. Jesus is criticizing him. But the truth is, he's drawing it out of him to confess his mistakes. And, and that's what he's saying. I failed to agape you, Lord. I was only at phileo. And this recommissioning of the sheep, verse 18. But most assuredly, Peter, I say to you, when you were younger... You girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. It's a prophecy of Peter's life. Jesus gives him a little window of what his life is going to be back. Now, Peter only hears what sounds like martyrdom to him. He misses the most important thing Jesus said. Well, I'm going to be bound. I'm going to die. No, Jesus said, when you are old. You remember they were gathered in the room that night with all the doors and windows locked and Jesus appeared in the center of it. They were hiding from the Romans because they thought they were going to be crucified right away. And Jesus gives him the answer. No, no, no. You're going to get old, Peter. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a, a great promise unless you thought you were going to die in the next 24 or 48 hours. Peter missed it. He's struggling. It turns out that old age gives Peter a great advantage. He gets an opportunity to go over much of the Roman Empire. He ends up being able to speak to many, many people. Age gave him authority. And age will do that for you. We live in a country that glorifies youth you know well you gotta be cool and young and and when it comes yeah, anyway we won't get in trouble here so but when you get older and you do it right and you follow the Lord and you just be careful with your life then people will listen to what you have to say People find out that my wife and I have been married, same person this whole time, and gone through some really interesting times. 
but we still love each other. And they go, well, that guy's a pastor, which normally really weird people, but, you know, he's married to the same person. He, he has a cool hot rod. <laughs> Plays guitar, okay. Maybe I can ask him something important about life, and he might have something for them. Age gives you a position. Read a great story. Uh, Paul Harvey, the, the radio announcer, he told it uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, Hershey, Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, an elderly lady was in her Mercedes and she went to the local mall. And it's a, a busy day, it's crowded, there's no place to park. She's got a a 700 series Mercedes with like a quarter of a million dollars. Beautiful car. Her husband died and left her a lot of money. And so she's just trying to find a place to park to go buy something. Can't, can't, can't find it. Then finally she sees a guy loaded with packages running to his car and opens the trunk and she's right in the right place. So she pulls up, turns on her blinker and waits for him to load it all. And he gets in and starts it up and backs out and, and she's getting ready to turn in when a brand new Corvette bright red with the paper plate shoots, slips in before her and she couldn't believe it she pulled up and she rolled down her window and the young guy gets, gets out and she says young man I, I was waiting for that space that's my space and he throws his keys up in the air and he backhands them and puts them in his pocket and he said well that's what it means to be young and quick and she shook her head. She couldn't believe it. So she puts her Mercedes in reverse, backs up, then puts it in low, stands on it, and crushes the back of his brand new red Corvette. You know, they're out of fiberglass. And fiberglass just goes all over the parking lot. And he runs over. He's screaming, what, what? You're crazy. What did you, why did you do that? And she said, that's what it means to be old and rich. Peter will do well, have much more impact when he's older, is what Jesus is saying. Verse 19, thus he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. But when he had spoken this, he said to him, two words, follow me. Really important lesson here. This is the last word of Jesus to Peter and, uh, and for us. Follow God. To follow him means that Jesus is forever going in front of it. When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you become a disciple of him. And he will lead you. All you have to do is follow where he chose you to go. I, somebody stopped me the other day and said, you, you, you go to a lot of strange places. Where have you been? Nepal. Why in the world did you go to Nepal? Well, there was a Bible college there and they asked me to come and teach. But like it's dangerous and they like kill Christians. Well, they didn't kill me, I got away. And, 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 well, and where else? Burma, Nigeria, uh, Turkey. Why all these strange places? I said, well, I don't go for adventure. I go because I feel like God is leading me. I'm supposed to go there because it's the kingdom. And it has to do with fishing. And it has to do with taking care of sheep. That's your call on your life too. Be available for God to use you anywhere he tells you to go. Be ready to do that. It's an adventure. It's a great life of following him. That's what he says. Just follow me. Second section. Comparisons. Chapter 20. I mean verse 20 of chapter 21. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now if you've been with us this book is written by the disciple whom Jesus loved, John. Now, John loved Jesus and Jesus loved John. The difference is John knew it. Do you know that? Do you know that you are the disciple whom Jesus loves? He does. He loves you. And it's agape love, not just fond of love, but he does also phileo you. We looked at that Three weeks ago in chapter 18, God loves you. And that's what's going on here. John knows it. 
John trusts God. John follows God because he knows he's going to take care of him. So, how did he get to be known as that? Peter turning around saw him. Lord, who is the one? Oh, I'll, I better read it all. It won't make any sense. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the Last Supper, and said, Lord, who is it the one who betrays you? So that was Peter that was asking John to ask Jesus who was going to betray. And he said, you remember, well, I, I'm going to put my bread in the, it's called a sop, in the dip at the Passover meal. And the one who I hand it to is the one who's going to betray so Peter, seeing John, the guy who wrote this gospel, says to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Peter has just been forgiven for denying Christ three times, and now he starts making comparisons, him versus John. And he falls right back into it again. He gets caught in that trap. Now, Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? It's none of your business, Peter. You follow me. Comparing ourselves to other people always brings confusion. It makes you stumble because you have a different set of gifts, a different calling on your life than the person sitting next to you or across the room. And it's really difficult when you're looking at a person who has the same talents you have, only about 20 times more of each talent. And you're going, oh, I'm such a has-been. <laughs> and you get depressed. That's what's going on in Peter here. But he's caught in this comparison thing. I was reading about comparisons, and I, I came on this great story. Willie Mays was a, one of the greats of professional baseball. You may not be a baseball person. doesn't matter. The illustration still works. And... Uh, and, but when he was a young man, he just got into the majors, he, he saw J uh, Joe DiMaggio play, who was like the top of his game at this time. And, uh, and Willie May started to copy Joe DiMaggio. And, and DiMaggio walked a little pigeon-toed, so Willie May started walking a little pigeon-toed, and he held the bat kind of in a strange way. But for him, it worked, hitting all kinds of home runs. And so Willie May started holding the bat that way. And, uh, and then uh, everything he did, he found that he wanted to be Joe DiMaggio. Finally, his coach picked it up, what was going on. He took him aside and he said, uh, Willie, I need to talk to you. And he said, okay. He said, you know, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I am too, coach. He said, God made Willie Mays the way he is. You need to be Willie Mays. You are not. Joe DiMaggio, you will never be Joe DiMaggio. You just be what God made you to be. Simple enough. Willie Mays said it was the defining day of his life. From that time on, when he got up to bat, he just bat the way that felt natural, and he started hitting home runs. And he started to play without walking pigeon toe, and he became an amazing fielder. He became one of the greats of Major League Baseball just by simply getting his eyes off himself and trying to be somebody else that he wasn't. And all of a sudden, he was good at what he did. Now, confession time. Comparisons are only, always dangerous. Pattern number one, we compare ourselves with others. And, uh, and they are... Uh, maybe inferior. Well, I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler. That's good. Make it, if that makes you feel good, <laughs> you set the bar a little low, but, uh, but the other kind of comparison is the most dangerous. And that's the one where you pick somebody who is really, really, really gifted at the same thing you're gifted at. Confession. Uh, I have a guy like that in my life. It's not that way anymore, but when I was a brand new pastor, I wanted to be Billy Graham. Don't laugh. I was dead serious. And I watched him, and I, I listened to the way he put his sermons together, 
And, and I went, oh, that's it. That's it. I can be him. <laughs> I always long to be able to say at the end of the service here, when we do an altar call, I, I've always wanted to be able to say, the buses will wait. <laughs> but in this church, it would be a Toyota minivan. <laughs> And when Billy Graham says that it's 55 passenger Greyhounds and there's a 100 of them out there. And then about 4,000 people come forward, sometimes 10,000 people, just because he said, if you want to meet Jesus, come down. When I do that, it's a great blessing if one person (laughs) raises their hand. And, And God began to speak to me about hey, you're not, you're never going to be, you just be at Ray. Ah, It's not very good, Lord. He said, that's for me to judge, not for you. Just be yourself. So what is it that you want to be? Who is it do you want to be? What person do you admire so much that you would change places with them? That's sin. Because God made you the way you are, And he doesn't make any junk. He doesn't make mistakes. Never does. Then the saying went out, verse 23, among the brethren, that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will, that he remain till I come, what's that to you? Apparently this conversation went throughout the church and people started saying that John, the apostle, was never going to die, at least until Jesus came. The lesson for you, people often misunderstand God's message to you. Something that God says to you that's very important, don't be overly concerned if even people that love you and know you well think you're just bragging or you're trying to claim that God spoke to you. What do you think, you're some kind of saint or something? Some things are just meant to be between you and God. And and that's a wonderful idea. That God would entrust you with something about you, not to tell other people about, but just part of your relationship. Some people will never understand, never believe that God can actually speak to somebody in a way that they know for sure it's him. So if God's done that in your life and you tried to share it and you got beat up, just hold on to it. Don't worry about it. That's what John is saying. Last section, big truth. 24, this is the disciple who testified of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. John is a personal witness. What he's saying is, I'm an eyewitness, and everything I write here, I swear to it. This is an affidavit. Uh, We found them from the first century from Roman courts, and he words it exactly the same way he would as if he was being deposed a deposition, and he would swear to it this way. The we here means the collective witness of all the apostles, all the rest of us. We know that his testimony, John's testimony is true. They all signed it too. And there are also many things that Jesus did. Uh, This is a very intriguing verse to me, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be, could be written. Amen. So John wants us, the readers, to know that he's been very selective in the things he said about Jesus. He, he actually already said that back in chapter 20, that there were only seven miracles that he picks. And he said he picked them for one purpose, so that we would look at the miracle and realize only God could do that miracle. It wasn't timing. It was the creator of the universe was walking on earth. Here's what he said in chapter 20, verse 30. And truly Jesus did many other signs, miracles, that pointed towards something in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, these seven are written, that you may believe, critical word, that you may trust that you may rely on 
Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you will have eternal life in his name. That's the foundation. You put your trust that Jesus died on a cross for your sins, and you will be living for eternity. That's what's going on here. So this is Peter's recommissioning, and it could be very much like yours. I don't know where you are this morning. Back at verse 17, he said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And, and Peter's grieved because Jesus is asking him that question. I, I love the statement of an old Scottish pastor, his name McLaren, on this point. He said, Jesus Christ asks each one of us, not for obedience primarily, not for repentance primarily, not for vows primarily, not even for conduct primarily, but he asks each one of us for our heart. And that being given, all the rest will follow. It's all about heart. God is looking at hearts here this morning. And he sees those of us that need to ask him to cleanse us. If we confess our sins, confess. Con means a cross. Fess means say the same thing God does. Say the same thing God does about, God, I, 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 that was a mistake. That was a sin. Forgive me. The Bible is filled with men and women who blew it but were smart enough to realize if they went back to God, he would forgive them. Great leaders in the Bible. No, you go, oh, no, yeah, he, he, he preached for 100 years. He built an ark in his backyard, and he went through the flood. How did he do after that flood? Well, when he got out of the ark, he planted some grapevines. They fermented the wine, and he got passed out drunk. He blacked out. And then he got naked as a jaybird. He confessed. God gave him a second chance. How about Abraham? Abraham lies about his wife twice. Said she was his sister to a harem owner, a, a king, king of Imelech. And uh, he tried to help God out. And he had an affair with his wife's servant girl, Hagar. The Middle East conflict that's going on right now is because of that. I mean, Jews and Arabs are still fighting because of that little indiscretion by Abraham. Three times, he's the God of the third chance. Jacob, a liar, a cheat, deceiver, that's what his name means. Finally, God sent an angel to wrestle with him, pins him, and he's still fighting him. So the angel touches his thigh and he's gonna walk with a limp the rest of his life. But he became... Jacob became Israel. The, the word Jacob means liar, cheat, stealer, conniver. And God changed his name after he wrestled and surrendered to Israel. That means ruled by God. So he's the God of the fourth chance. How about Moses? Lost his temper. Murdered an Egyptian. Ran 40 years on the backside of the desert. Talked to a bush. Then he spent 40 years on the right side of the desert. But he started beating on rocks in the wilderness instead of speaking to him like God said. And he didn't get to go into promised land until the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Elijah and Moses, the God of the fifth chance. Well, how about Rahab, the prostitute from Jericho? You're not even supposed to say that sort of stuff in polite company, not in church. But she met two godly men, children of Israel. They told her about the God of Israel, and she forsook her life of prostitution. Not only was she, was, was she forgiven, she married into the Israeli, into the child, the great, 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 great grandson of Abraham, and put herself in the line of the Messiah. When you read through Luke, you'll see her name. 
He's the God of the eighth and the ninth and the tenth chance. King David, oh my goodness, where do I start? My point, Jesus told a story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Teenage boy comes to his dad, I want my inheritance now. Dad gives it to him. He takes the chariot and goes to Las Vegas and blows it all. Slightly changed the story. (laughs) So he comes back home. And as he's coming back home, walking, because he's been working in a pig farm, his dad sees him a long way off, and he runs to him, it says, falls on his neck and weeps on his son and completely forgives him. Now, if Jesus was telling that story in the context of what we're looking at this morning, let me add to it. Two months later, the son comes to his dad a second time. says, Dad, I I want more inheritance. And his dad, the picture of Father God, gives it to him. And he goes back to Las Vegas and he blows it all again. And as he's walking home the second time, his dad sees him, runs down, cries, and forgives him. <laughs> well, well, how many times will God forgive? It's deeper than the sea. It's what that Norwegian explorer was saying. It's deeper than that. He's the God of the 10th chance, the 20th chance, the 100th chance. How far do you want to push God? I don't know, because no one's ever done it. No one's ever found the end of how many times you can blow it and then come back to him and ask him to forgive you, and he'll do it every single time. End with the true story. It comes from Ireland. A young girl uh, and uh, and her husband were praying for a a child, and uh, they were living out in the in the heather, way out in the middle of nowhere in a, in a little cabin, and, and she became pregnant, and uh, she gave birth to a little girl. And uh, they were both so excited, but she died in childbirth. And uh, the, the dad was broken, but he took care of the little baby and, and then raised her. And they became very, very close. And he, he taught her the scriptures, and and She was a great young lady. But then in her teenage years, she met a young man that was no good and asked her father about him. He said, no, 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 no. That's not the right guy for you. You have to to wait till God brings the right person. But she ran off with the young man, married him, and uh, it broke her father's heart. And uh, she got pregnant had a baby, and her husband left her alone. And she didn't know what to do. So she wrote a letter to her father asking him to forgive her. But he was so disappointed. He was so frustrated. When he saw her name on the letter, he put it on the fireplace, and he didn't open it. So she wrote another letter six months later. Then he looked at it. And he, and he just couldn't forgive her. He couldn't bring himself. He was still angry, and, and he put it there on the fireplace. And that happened nine times, four and a half years. Every six months, she wrote a letter, and he never opened any of them. Finally, she realized he wasn't going to. Her son was almost five years old, and she decided to take her, fun, her son to her father's home. And uh, when they got there, she had spoken to the little boy and set it all up. Get on the front porch and she says, now remember you, you go through the door and you look for the fireplace because your grandpa is sitting right next to the fire. It's where he always stays. And you're going to run over and jump on his lap and say hi, grandfather. And so uh, she opened the door, kid goes in, does better than that, sees the grandpa, runs to him, jumps up on his lap, puts his arms around his neck and says, I love you, grandpa. The old man melted. 
of course, and he scooped up his son and ran to the front porch, saw his daughter and hugged her and forgave her. We have also greatly disappointed our Heavenly Father. But the Son has gone in for us and given us access to Father God Almighty. Do you love him? Now is your opportunity to surrender. Would you stand please and we'll pray together. Lord, we thank you that you have made a way for all of us that you were disappointed, but you gladly forgive us because you are the God of the third chance, fourth chance, 100th chance. Most of us in this room just thank you for that, Lord. But we know there are others probably here this morning that are not walking with you and they're caught up in sin. And we pray, Lord, that you would give them the grace to surrender to you and confess their sins. Christians, please pray. So I wonder if there's someone here this morning, maybe you're here for the first time, but God is speaking to you about asking for forgiveness and surrendering your life to him. This moment is for you. We wouldn't do anything to embarrass you, but if you'd like to know that your sins are forgiven, if you'd like to know that you're going to spend eternity with your heavenly father, if you're ready to surrender your life to God, would you let me know you're ready by looking up at me and raising your hand? I won't do anything to embarrass you. I'll just acknowledge your hand. God bless you. Two of you behind you, two more. God bless you. A couple right there. God bless you. On the aisle here, behind the sound booth, God bless you. Right in front of me, God bless you. In the aisle, yes, and you, and you, and you. Back, God bless you, two of you. If I missed your hand, don't worry, God didn't. He's been waiting for your hand. Those of you that raised your hands, would you please talk to God with us? We're going to make it easy. We're going to ask him to forgive our sins with you, and he's going to do that right where you're standing. Everybody, please say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Those of you that raised your hands, we'd encourage you to go over these double doors to my right. Some of our elders are there. We don't want anything from you. We'll, we'd love to give you a Bible. Pray for you. Anyone that needs prayer, go there. To the rest, God bless you. Give somebody a hug before you go home. Pastor Rick tonight, you love him.